I, I can, you know, I work on the blackboard when I'm done, but I don't want to run the screen up and down and turn the lights on and off and, and so on intermediately. So I'll stand off to one side and point to the slides and, and talk a lot. Uh, but uh, also, too, I don't know whether I have a half an hour worth of material or three hours worth of material. So we'll, we'll find out as we go along. But uh, basically, this is all a quest for realism. The uh, computer graphics started a long time ago with uh, simple lines and points and so on. Screen. And uh, <clears throat> about seven, in the early 70s, uh, people discovered how to do polygons and shaded surfaces. And the, uh, that was quite a breakthrough because then flight simulation became a real possibility. And the government funded quite a bit of research in that area. And really, they had just very, very primitive, simple shapes. But, uh, okay. we all the so we yeah, we got to get rid of another light. OK, how's that? Think, think get this monitor off, too, again. Yeah, see what you mean. So if you put something in front of it. Is there a, a simple switch? Yeah. Um. Yeah. All right. <laughs> That'll slow down the fumbling for a while. OK, so uh, the, uh, the mathematics involved in this sort of thing is very simple in your algebra. And uh, from that point, people went on to more complex shapes. It had some, some interesting uh, usefulness rather than just toys of triangles and, and so on. This is a, a knee joint that's being modeled at Case Western. A lot of these slides will have some credits at the bottom. These are from SIGGRAPH 80 and 79 slide sets. And I just called them out to illustrate what I'm talking about. But most of the pictures that people have been making to the shaded pictures, are really the only kind I'm interested in, are um, with polygons. And because they're fairly simple, and although they can be extremely complex when, when uh, put together in large combinations. The uh, other forms of objects that, that people have been able to do, uh, that wanted to do, were smooth. Now, polygons don't work too well in smooth objects, as you can see. This is a Space shuttle simulation. This is, in fact, a frame from a flight simulator, a uh, training simulator at, at Houston. And uh, this blending that you can see that across there is a, another step in the direction of realism. That's called grow shading, and I'm sure they've mentioned it if they haven't. I just did. Uh, but still, the silhouette is faceted. So uh, then are other geometric primitives besides polygons, like spheres and cylinders. And uh, this is a particularly special algorithm that just renders spheres and cylinders. And it puts a nice little black border around the sphere. Uh, they use it a lot at Livermore. But uh, these are all these objects, including these incredibly complex ones with like 4,000 atoms in it, are uh, still looking at silica artificial. They look like somebody cut them out and made them in a machine shop or, or whatever. They're made from drawings. Now, <clears throat> how's that? That's right. <laughs> Natural looking atoms don't stand still. Uh, so we don't know what they look like. Anyway, uh, people have been able to do much better with transparency and some colored light sources and reflections and shadows and highlights and textures and so on. But still, it has a certain air of artificiality. Uh, this is about as far as texture maps have been carried. It's a combination of color and and normal bump uh, effect. But if you'll notice, the, uh, it shrinks to the top here. And there's a, there's a kind of a parametric squashing that's going on. And you can see the little bits of the, of the window up there. and Pieces of the window here is how it's distorted to fit the, the shape of the patch. No one has yet figured out a, a clean way of taking a picture uh, and pasting it on the side of an object like this with, and retaining whatever metric you had in the picture. So it still looks artificial. Uh, now, this is a, a good example of texture in a flight simulation area, although the jaggies are all over the place. What they've got is tags on these polygons and some sort of a table lookup process that generates noise of a particular spectral characteristic. And so when the flight simulator is painting in this area, it, it reads noise number five, and it comes out looking like that. Uh, it's not bad, but it's frame-to-frame -frame coherence is a little weird. I mean, it's sort of like the man with the, with the checkered 
shirt in the cartoons as, he, as he's walking along that the checkers go this way, but his legs go every which way. You see what I mean? Uh, okay, this is an example of a bicubic patch object. It's got about 8,000 patches in it. Contrast is kind of, kind of dead, but uh, this is reasonably realistic as far as you can go with patches. Um, this is, in fact, a cover on the proceedings that I did last year. So this is yours? That's mine, yeah. Now, this is a little more realistic picture. It's uh, maybe a little out of focus. This was uh, somewhere near Los Alamos, and there are real mountains over there. Okay, now, given those polygon algorithms and, and patch algorithms and sphere algorithms and whatnot, make that picture. Well, <clears throat> there's a lot of data out there, and a lot of polygons, a lot of points, a lot of work. So uh, people have just given up. I mean, most, most flight simulators to rep represent this mountain would have maybe seven or eight polygons, usually triangles on that side, and maybe a, a, a flat one across there and a couple of rumpled ones there. And you'd get some sense of perspective because they could put in a haze factor, but that's about it. Things can get more difficult when you get close to the mountain. Uh, this is a uh, south side of Mount Rainier. Right? That's the north side. It's this backwards. Is a, this is a photograph of a mountain, not a. That, that's a real. That's a real mountain. We're, we're coming to that one. Uh, this is a real mountain. Well, I haven't got trees yet. Yeah, right. Right there. <laughs> but uh, that's a real mountain, and uh, I don't know how many triangles there are out there, but a uh, good many million. Uh, when you get closer, you. Uh, see all kinds of detail that you didn't see before. Now, if you're trying to simulate a realistic environment, you really have to have that detail. And the uh, methods that have been done so far either explicitly put in all the detail. Question? The, the picture before the last one with the names on the bottom, that was computer generated? No. No? I'll, I hope not. That, that one is a photograph of some mountains in New Mexico. Oh, just blurry. <laughs> Okay. No, it's a little out of focus. Um, what people have been able to do so far, though, is model smoke with hundreds and thousands of millions of points. Uh, unfortunately, it's not animatable. Uh, only one frame is, is all they could ever afford to do. Uh, and, and, and doing mountains and stuff, you start from a topographic map and you, you put a million points on the topographic map and, and sort of panel it like the, uh, the smooth mountain was done from a topographic map. But uh, that works okay to a point. Texture maps work okay to a point, too. Uh, texture maps have a postage stamp effect. When, if you were to, say, cover a, a forest with a, a forest texture, it, you'd have to have quite a few different panels, as it were, that were somehow matched at the edges so that when you covered the surface, it wouldn't look like it was like a checkerboard. Uh, and then, too, when you zoom in on it, if you want to get down and look at a tree, at some point you're going to see the individual bits in the texture map and it'll all look blank. So there's that problem. There's a parametric distortion problem, which I pointed out on the teapot. And uh, there's the fixed scale problem. That is to say, if I'm 200 miles away from this mountain, uh, it doesn't make sense to have all these polygons floating around in the computer. And if I'm, if I'm this close, it doesn't make sense to have those polygons floating around in the computer over there. So all this mess has uh, essentially discouraged people from trying to make pictures of things like this. But really, all the picture has to be is good enough to be recognizable. I mean, if, if you were, you know, the, the computer shouldn't have to work very hard on that ridge, but it should have to work harder on this. Just hard enough, though. Just hard enough to, in this case, to beat the film grain, but say the display resolution on your device. Other problems, too, that people have shied away from have to do with motion, extremely complex natural motion, like turbulence, uh, waterfalls, surf, uh, things like that that are just essentially intractable by any simple classical algebra or mathematics. So <clears throat> uh, all that I've been describing so far are deterministic models. That is to say, they, they start out from some, some simple description and go, and go their, their straight way and produce a picture. What we need to solve this problem are non-deterministic models, or in a sense, semi-random. And we have to mix, it, mix them together, because we do want a mountain there, but we really don't care what this texture is like as long as it looks real. We don't care 
whether there's a rock here or not. Although we might want a rock there, generally we wouldn't care. So <clears throat> the um, solution is to mix the two. Now, what we have here is a, a mixture of signal and noise. If, uh, if I want a, a ridge right here, that's my signal. But as far as, as the rest of this, that's noise. And so I can let the computer generate the noise. And I put in the signal. Now, the, um, the, uh, the idea here is to take uh, stochastic models. And a stochastic model is really made of several things. It's um, built from standard primitives like, like uh, triangles or polygons, patches, points, uh, volumes, whatever. And um, <clears throat> you start from that, usually. That's how you describe what you want to the computer uh, or to the, the, the process. And then the, uh, the process takes these simple models and generates a sample path of a stochastic process. And what that essentially means is a bunch of random numbers. And uh, these random numbers from the stochastic process are applied to the model to produce a randomized model. Now, to get a little more specific, what we need is an object or process to be modeled in, like, say, a mountain. Okay, we have to start, we have to have some goal so we know which, which pieces to select and, and how to uh, put them together. And we need a, uh, a stochastic process to provide the noise generator. And this can be three-dimensional noise, points in space, points on a, on a plane, points in a line, uh, points in time, points in some complex domain, whatever. And then given the, uh, the random numbers and the geometric model, we need an algorithm that can turn it into a picture. So there are two kinds of stochastic processes that we've used making pictures. There are ones that are based on some physical properties of the model. Uh, for example, if you have taken some statistical distributions of stars in, in, in space, uh, you can generate a random number distribution that has the same distribution as stars in space and use that to drive a star generator that'll generate star fields. Or uh, you can just try something ad hoc, and I've got a few examples of totally ad hoc, off-the-wall processes that generate reasonably look good-looking pictures, and, and we'll use them again. <clears throat> but uh, to solve this, this level of detail problem, what you need is a recursive algorithm so that, that, if, that it, it's the, um, it works entirely local. So when it gets to some spot in, in the screen when it says, that's, that's good enough, then it can stop. But otherwise, it may have to go recursively. Otherwise, there are, the, there are difficulties that, you get in, that I'll get into in a minute. But uh, <clears throat> in order to make this thing stable, we really need an interpolating process, one that, that takes the, uh, the, the signal as given, and as it's adding noise, tends to stay locally and, and interpolate the bounds of the signal. That way, we have some control over where the mountain ends up. It might end up in the wrong place if we don't have some, something like that. Also, it, there are problems with runaway, blow up, and, and divergence, and, and things like that, that that can uh, lead to a lot of grief when trying to make an animated sequence. <clears throat> so that's, that's a fairly straightforward introduction to uh, stochastic models. Now, I want to talk about fractals for a little bit. Uh, there are two kinds of fractals, uh, random, sto random uh, or stochastic fractals and deterministic or pattern-like fractals. And the, uh, the pictures I've been running through here all have strong fractal components. The, uh, I may have to back up on some of these. But um, <clears throat> fractal, uh, a fractal, we'll get to it here in a bit. These are just scenes that I picked out that, that uh, as a, uh, a modeler, as it were, or a synthetic image person, intrigued me. So just how would I do these? And uh, they all have a substantial amount of noise in them. OK. <laughs> they do, in a way, in as, in, as, in as much as I don't know what the signal is. <clears throat> OK, this is where I started. Uh, April 78, Scientific American, is a review of 
this book, which I have a copy of here, and I'll, I'll flip through some of the pages and run them on the monitor later on uh, so they, they can get on the tape. But um, it's written by a fellow named Mendelbrot. He's an IBM uh, fellow, which means they pay him to use his name. And he's a probability theorist, mostly. He worked, he studied under uh, Levy in France. So if you know probability theory is rather heavy, I guess. Anyway, he's worked all over the place in hydrology, communications theory, ergonomics, economics, statistical thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, biology, geophysics, any place he could find an application for his, his uh, pet stuff. Well, it turns out that what he's done is found something in every one of those fields that, that was common. And in the sense, it's uh, a grand synthesis. He's found a simple mathematical object that pervades all those fields and a lot of others that uh, we also find useful for generating pictures. And this object he calls a fractal. And uh, what does a fractal you say? <coughs> fractal is a set with non-integer dimension. Now, for those of you who know measure theory, what it means is a set whose hausdorff besikovich dimension is greater than its topological dimension. Those of you who don't know measure theory, it means <coughs> that, it's, that it's rumpled or rough <laughs> or, or ragged or uh, uh, infinitely big in a small space. <coughs> it's based on uh, what are called gauge functions. And what it amounts to is the classical dimension, the definition of dimension is that um, the, the measure of the set and in the case, well, in the case of, of Hausdorff dimension, that's Gauffey's dimension, the measure of a set can be turned into some formula in which the, the kernel of the formula is something like uh, some characteristic length of the dimension to some power. And for a normal plane, the characteristic length is some, some distance in the plane, and the power is 2. Uh, for interesting sets, the power is some real number that's not an integer. Uh, it's not hard to prove that there are sets that have uh, that property where the, the power is, is some fraction or some log ratio of logarithms or, or whatever. So a lot of examples of these things. The uh, space filling curves, for example, are curves, but they have dimension two because they fill the plane. They cover every point in the set. Brownian motion is another example. It fill, touches every point in three space but it is, in effect, a curve. Um, those are integer dimension, but they're higher dimension than the, than the underlying set. Uh, the, uh, the picture on the front of this book is fractal. The, the uh, length of the boundary between the white and the blue is uh, far more than infinite. It's, it's, it's bigger than, uh, than the simple infinity. And so, <clears throat> There are a lot of examples like this. The triadic canter set, where you take the middle third recursively out of each, each piece of a line segment, uh, has uh, infinitely many points. I'm going backwards. Has infinitely many points, and in fact, you can show that any point is arbitrarily close to another one, but there's a lot of points that are missing. So it's not a line, and it's not a finite collection of points. It's something else. It's one of these. OK, fractals have some interesting properties. Uh, there's basically uh, the most important one is uh, self-similarity. Self-similarity means that if you take a, a fractal set and magnify it by some change in scale, uh, you still have a fractal set. And in fact, the fractal set has the same statistical properties as the one you started with. A uh, simple example of that is um, the, uh, the, the triadic canter set. If I take the middle third out of, the, out of, the, out of each fragment, as it recursively goes down, uh, at some point, I can take any one of the fragments that I have left, magnify it to the size of the original, and I have exactly the same set. Uh, if I have something that's statistical, say like, like a pile of rocks in, on the mountain earlier, you can uh, magnify that quite a few times anyway, and it still looks like, the, like a pile of rocks, especially if you take a chunk out of the middle and you don't see trees or, or moss. You can't tell what scale it is. Uh, another example of that is when the astronauts were landing on the moon, they couldn't tell their altitude by looking out the window because the distribution of crater sizes is fractal. And there's no way to tell how high you are because there's no fixed scale reference. They had to use radar to 
keep from crashing. So uh, it's all self-similarity, and that's what it amounts to. But self-similarity, similarity ratio, uh, has to do with the uh, the rate of increase in in geometry as the as in surface or or length or whatever as the as you do the magnification, and it, it's related to the fractal dimension of the object. Okay, here's an example of a piece of self-similar uh, photograph. Now, looking at that, you can't tell how far away it is, how big it is, although it looks kind of big, or what it is. Well, uh, I took this picture last spring, and Mount St. Helens is right over here. Uh, I was about 40 miles away when I heard about it, and that's about 15 miles to the west. Um, that's quite a day. <clears throat> anyway, you can't tell how far away you are, basically, because the, the, the turbulence is, is self-similar. Okay. <clears throat> now, at this point, I knew these, these things existed. I'd read the articles, read the books. And Mandelbrot has a, a few photographs in his uh, books that uh, were made of synthetic terrain. But none of them have been uh, explained how he did it. You go through the book with a magnifying glass or something better, and you will not find one word of explanation or reference to a word of explanation as to how he made those pictures. So <clears throat> uh, I felt that either it was some secret process or he, uh, he had somebody else do it or, or something. So uh, I set out to do it myself and found a fairly, fairly simple way to do it. But the ways that, the ways that had been done before the, w the fractals have been made. In fact, the, me the methods that are mentioned in his book are these three. A uh, shear displacement process is real simple. You start with a line segment and break it at some arbitrary point and displace the left and right halves up and down some Gaussian distance, uh, a Gaussian distribution. And break it again and do it again. Break it again and do it again. Just keep doing that until, the th until you're tired or until it looks good enough. And you have a very rough looking ragged shape and it can, it's fairly easy to prove that that ragged shape has this property. Uh, down to a certain level of, of graininess where you stop breaking it. But the, uh, the problem with that is that it's an n-squared process for a line. Every time you break it, you've got to move n points. And you've got to do it approximately n times to make it look good. And that's no good, even for a line, an n-squared process is atrocious. And for a surface, it's n forth. So uh, that's out. Uh, the modified Markov process is the one that, that uh, Mandelbrot spent the most time on, I think. Uh, he's mainly interested in time series. And so what he's been doing is trying to find some, some process that can grind out numbers that have all these fractal properties for doing things like simulating communication channels and that sort of thing. So what, what it is, the Markov process is a, uh, essentially a black box that produces a uh, random sequence. But <clears throat> the modified Markov process in this sense is, is the black box has a memory in that the the numbers that come out of the box have a slight dependence on the numbers that came out of it before. And the farther back you go into history, the less the dependence is. So it's a kind of a decaying dependence. And so it, it's kind of, a, in effect, a smooth random number sequence. OK, the other method, that doesn't work for surfaces because you can't do Markov on the surface. And you can't back the thing up. You can't, you can't refine it. You can't do anything with it. So it's useless for pictures. Uh, Fourier methods, well, turns out that a uh, fractal set, or fractional Brownian set, which I'll get into in a bit, has a, um, a very simple power spectrum. It's 1 over f to some power. And so what you do is you generate a signal with the, or a Fourier transform of the appropriate amplitude and white noise for the phase, and inverse transform it, and you have a fractal set. It works in one dimension, two, three, four, whatever. Uh, except it's n log n, and you're stuck with a fixed grid and um, all those problems. No good for mountains. So <clears throat> um, let's see, what else I want to say? OK. Um, yeah, fractional rounding motion. That's where we get into that. OK, we talked a little bit about fractional rounding motion. OK. Uh, fractional Brownian motion is the, the subset of fractals that are most interesting for, for natural simulation, like terrain or, or whatever. And <clears throat> what it amounts to is 
a form of Brownian motion with a fractal dimension and not a Brownian, so Brownian, strict Brownian motion has a dimension two. It covers every point, say in a plane, it would have dimension two. But a fractional Brownian motion has dimensions slightly less than two, somewhere between one and two. So it, it kind of kind of has kind of wanders in a direction rather than sort of wanders around in, in spot. And <clears throat> it can be extended to multiple dimensions, multiple uh, dimension uh, sets. That is to say, you can have fractional Brownian surfaces, fractional Brownian solids, uh, whatever, fractional Brownian time, or processes that exist in space and time. A uh, two-dimensional example is terrain, and terrain, is, in fact, has a dimension of about 2.3. Uh, it's good, yeah, I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, so, uh, isosurfaces of turbulent fluids uh, have dimension uh, 3 plus. What that means is if you take, say, uh, a cloud, and a cloud where you see it is moisture, and that's r the region of space that has humidity greater than 1, or greater than 100 percent. And if you, if you look at the surface of that object that um, where the, the humidity gradient or the humidity level is, is exactly 100 percent, that surface is a fractal surface. The um, <clears throat> example of, I think I must have skipped that somewhere, of why terrain has a dimension of 2.3. Good, good, uh, good place to start. Uh, imagine an island say Britain or, or something like that that's relatively big. If we have a, we want to measure the coastline of the island. So we have ourselves a yardstick. Let's say we've got a map that's not so big. And we use an inch for a yardstick. And so we can define a, uh, a, a formula for the length of the perimeter of the island by the number of yardstick steps times the length of the stick. Okay? And so we do that and we plot it on the graph point, some stick length versus perimeter length. Okay, and then we shorten the stick and do it again. And it turns out that we, we pick up a few bays and, and a few peninsulas that we missed before. And we may pick up an island or miss an island or two, but we don't count islands at this point. We're just going to count the actual perimeter. So we get a little, it gets a little longer. And then as we go to a shorter stick, it gets a little longer, and a shorter stick, it gets a little longer, and a shorter stick, it gets a little longer. It turns out that you can go all the way down to an actual physical inch and go around the surface or the perimeter of Britain. And that thing is still on a straight line. Now, <clears throat> a set that has that property is self-similar. And in fact, the slope of this line is, is directly related to the fractal dimension of the object. And by measuring a lot of coastlines and a lot of maps, and I suppose doing, going out there with a the yardstick actually and measuring it on foot, People have determined that the slope of this line is, is about 2.3, or 1.3, actually. It's 1.3 for the line, and, and hence, since it's a zero set of a, a surface, then the a surface is 2.3. So <clears throat> that, uh, that's interesting, and, and that relates to how the algorithm works. Now, well, question? Yes, I have a question. Sure. What, what do you mean the slope is 2.3? It's obviously not. It's 1.3. 1.3. Yeah. It, it has to do, I can show you in the book the, re the reference, but... It's, it can't be linear forever because you can have... Oh, a you're right. Absolutely. You get down to the surface tension of water, and it starts making no sense. Uh, <laughs> you get out, <clears throat> you go, to go this way to a yardstick that's longer than the island, and it makes no sense. So, so there's a maximum... Right. There's, there's what's called an inner scale and an outer scale, between which one can say the set has a fractal dimension. Okay. And that's a good point. And, and the... the with, with our modeling, what we've attempted to do is, is to build processes that have a known fractal dimension that we can employ at various scales. Uh, for example, uh, if you have some rounded hills that may be composed of very rough rock, at a, at a large scale, they, they have fairly low dimension because they're smooth, but at a, at a fine scale, they have a high dimension as, as they're rough. And, and being able to transition from one dimension into the other smoothly as you go, as you refine the, the resolution, is, uh, is yet an unsolved problem, although I don't think anybody's really worked on it. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, the method I discovered is here. This is a, um, the simplest example of it. There's a refinement of it that was independently discovered by two fellows in Texas, and uh, it produces better mathematical results, but visually they're about the same. Okay, what we have here 
It's called a line-to-line -line function. What that means is that it goes from the real number line to the real number line. And you can think of it as a function of t or x or, or whatever, but if you put x there, people ask me, why, why, why isn't there y up there? So this is t. <laughs> <coughs> OK. Uh, start with two points. Any two points, some distance, whatever displacement. Find the midpoint of the line segment between them and break the line there and displace the midpoint some distance, up or down. Now, the, uh, it doesn't, first of all, it doesn't have to be the midpoint. Secondly, this distance up or down can come from any distribution you want. It doesn't have to, it can be uniform, it can be Gaussian, it can be skewed, it can be anything. In fact, uh, I've made some very good pictures with some really bizarre distributions. So, <clears throat> okay, you do that. And then you got two lines, two, two new lines. Well, depending on how you're doing this, you can, uh, you can say, well, that line is good enough, but this line's too long. Let's break this one again. Or you can say, well, let's carry it down in levels or do whatever you like. But essentially, you take this line and you break it and you pick some number out of a random distribution and say here, and so you've got a line that looks like that, and this one may go like that or whatever. So you keep doing that until you're satisfied. Now, this has got, I think, 512 points in it or 511 or something like that. Um, the, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's what that is. Now, the method that the other fellows devised, which generates, like I said, better numerical results uh, at a finer scale, this, this particular method uh, produces a relatively smooth line at, at the extremely high numbers of subdivisions, like 15 or 20. It, fairly, it smooths out on the, on the hills. In the flats, it's, it's normally rough, but on the steep spots, their, their method produces more spikes, and this one's smoother. Uh, what they do is, is that uh, at each level of subdivision, they multiply the uh, offset, that is to say, the, the magnitude of the random number, by uh, on a factor that's close to 1. It's either bigger or, or less than 1. So well, actually, what the algebraically, what the process is here is we find a midpoint. And we have a number called an offset, or a roughness factor. And we take the, the, uh, the displacement out of the, the displacement is a product of the number from the random number distribution, the length of this line, that is to say delta t, and the roughness factor. So what we have is a scale-independent shape. So that, that if, if t were, if t and h were a different magnitude, we still have that same shape given the same random number. So if we, if we pull 0.5 out of, the, out of the distribution, we always get that shape. And that's, that's an effect where self-similarity comes in. Yes? How is that different from the shearing that you mentioned? OK, the shear process, this is similar to the shear process, except that we don't have to move all these points. Well, all we move is one point. Shearing that you mentioned. OK, the shear process, this is similar to the shear process, except that we don't have to move all these points. Well, all we move is one point. Yes, I wasn't clear why. The shear? Sure? OK. Um, the shear process is just, just like a shear would do it, just does do you this. Do lose connectivity? Yes, you do. You, you've got a discontinuity right there, or, or okay. a steep line. Uh, as well as, I mean, if, if this were a shear process, this whole line would be displaced upward. And uh, all the points in the middle would be displaced with it. But in this case, I only have to create one new point, and then topologically, they're connected, but that's all. Uh, the second method, OK, we can generalize this a little bit. Instead of displacing the point vertically, we can displace it perpendicularly. And now we have x and y, because we're operating in a plane. Now this point, uh, this, this process uh, is the same as before. That is to say, we, we take two points, find the length, the distance of the line, the distance between them, and a random number, and an offset multiplier, and that determines which side of the line and, and how far out we go to make the new midpoint. Now this process, as you can see, can back up on itself, and in fact it does a little bit here. This is a relatively tame one. They can really tie themselves in a knot. Uh, but that, uh, that's a fair, a fair simulation of, of an electric arc. Uh, OK, we can generalize this further. Relax the constraint on the midpoint, so I'll just say it's somewhere in that box. And this is what you get. Now, with this one, since we've relaxed the constraint on the midpoint, uh, we have lines that are that that 
that get long and lines that get short. And uh, although, depending on how the size of this box, you, the line segments that you create will always be shorter than the one that you started with, although that's no guarantee if the box gets big. And uh, stand back if that happens. <coughs> so uh, what we have here is this, this has been, these have been carried down to the exact same number of levels. This is a balanced tree, in effect, subdivision. But the, uh, the parts here are uh, stayed on the long side. And what we have here is a random walk with random velocity. Uh, the other one was a random walk with constant velocity. Uh, excuse me, can you repeat uh, the, uh, how the function is generated to uh, guarantee self-similarity? OK. Basically, the same process is, is performed on every fragment. OK, so we start out with, with a, a line segment. And we interpolate. This is a funny form of interpolation. We apply this process on the line segment to produce two new line segments. And the reason that we have self-similarity here in a geometric, uh, intuitive sense is that, that the process, that there's the shape of this, this triangle is independent of the magnitude of x and y. Because the displacement off of the midpoint, of the new midpoint, is proportional to the length of the line. That guarantees the fact that this always stays the same shape. Now, uh, strictly speaking, you can generate fractal sets that, in which this is not true. Uh, you, can, you can make it rougher or smoother as you go in, uh, down in subdivision. And all you have to, to guarantee to make the thing fractal is that the length of the curve increases without bound as, the, uh, as you subdivide. Uh, depending on your random number generator. Well, I'm not talking about anybody really doing this. The example is Zeus doing it, and you're, you're going along watching that zero time. So you'd run out of shapes, and you'd have to repeat in that sense. It's, it's repeating like a Stravinsky curve. So. OK, well, <clears throat> we do have a deterministic machine. I mean, they're ultimately no, deterministic. But uh, depending on how one picks the random numbers, I've never seen any, any uh, repetition. In, 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 a, in a practical sense. Sure, yeah. but, but is that what makes it a fractal still? Uh, it no, it doesn't. Repeating has nothing to do with it. Oh, it's, uh, it's what makes it a fractal, what makes it have, have dimension greater than one, is the fact that at every level of subdivision, the length of the curve increases by a, a common ratio. And so every time you go down one level of subdivision, the whole length of the curve increases by a common ratio. And you take that to the, to the limit, and you've gone way beyond infinity. <clears throat> now, we can generalize this to surfaces fairly easily. Uh, this was the first one I did. Uh, we start out with a quadrilateral, the dashed line. Break each edge, displace it vertically. You can displace it in some other direction if you like, but in this case, it's just vertical. And have four new edge midpoints, the same that process number one, line to line, uh, applied to every edge. And then we connect the edges, the new midpoints, and take two sample paths across this thing and add, or average, or whatever you like, the uh, resulting displacement. Create four new quadrilaterals and start over again. Um, in your SIG graph paper, I think you just said add them. And you, did you meant to say average? Do whatever you want. I think adding, adding them is, is better. But uh, if you add them, then the center can jump up a lot more than anything else, and you get distorted-looking patterns. No, stochastic. it's stochastic. It's true that, that if you add them, the distribution on the center is bigger. And uh, if it looks good, do it. That's what it matters. That's, that's all that matters. But uh, I, I worked it out one day, and um, frankly, I'm not sure if I remember exactly which was best. Uh, all the ones I've tried, it looked better if you, if you average. OK, I think you're right. Now, this is a, uh, in fact, this is a photograph of a Polaroid. <coughs> because at the time, I didn't have the appropriate equipment. Uh, what we have here is a uh, bicubic patch surface of about 1,000 patches or so. And the surface was made by taking that previous process 
and generating uh, 32 by 32 mesh and fitting beast blinds through the mesh and then converting the beast blind surface to Bezier patch surface and feeding it through the, my patch program with a giant ground plane polygon in it here that you see the edge of it to give a water level. And that's not bad if we add a few little texture to it and clean up the resolution and so on. That's uh, perfectly acceptable for an island. Now, <clears throat> that's a real fractal. Um, so let's see, what am I going to get into now? Oh, yes, now it gets interesting. Well, highly detailed. Uh, can we focus that a little bit better? All I have is forward and backward. Question? Um, when you when you split that plane uh, quadrilateral, is that you? Yeah. Me? At um, him. Yeah. That it doesn't say anything about about those four points having to be coplanar, right? Right. They can be anything. Uh, in fact, I tried to work out a hexagonal one, but it wasn't worth it. Uh, this is a triangle that was. Uh, done using that process. And uh, <clears throat> now at this, what I've been telling you so far as, is uh, essentially notes and pieces out of a paper that will appear in the communications of the ACM one of these days. Mm -hmm. uh, the other fellows in Texas right now are, are working on their part, uh, actually part of my part too, but I'm, I'm busier than they are, so they're working on most of the paper. And uh, whatever they uh, don't put in the paper, I'll publish separately. But <clears throat> So this, uh, this paper will appear in the communications. And what I'm going to tell you from now on out is unpublished and will not appear in the paper. And uh, not yet, something else. That's essentially how pictures like this are made. The, um, <clears throat> there's two sorts of, of subdivision processes that one can, can do. And I've been talking back when, with the mountains about recursive subdivision and working hard on the pieces that, that need it and not so hard on the others and, and so on. And I haven't given you any real examples of that until this and some of the ones to follow. But <clears throat> uh, up to now, it's been all a priori subdivision. That is, for the example, that the mesh with the island, that was 32 by 32 and, and stopped there. But uh, I'll explain how to do adaptive subdivision here in a minute. Now. Uh, let's see, should I? Yeah, I'll go ahead and run through the slides. And then, uh, got about a half an hour, I think I can, that's enough for this and questions. Okay, this is uh, a sing single triangle with the corners colored appropriately. Uh, the blue has a high dimension, the green is a medium dimension, and the red is a low dimension. This curve, and I think I can prove it, uh, at the, in the limit, is continuous, uh, although it's nowhere differentiable. And there are no islands in this, in this curve. It's, it's, a con it's a continuous closed curve. And um, there, are no, there are some, some digital islands, you might say. But uh, in the limit, that's connected. Uh, OK. This uh, has got about a couple hundred thousand triangles in it when it's, when it's done. Uh, this is a uh, shot off the monitor. You can see the dithering. The, um, this is a, uh, a triangular database for a mountain that was done from a uh, county map, not from a topographic map. And it has about 150 points in it or so. There are uh, uh, about half again that many triangles. And you're looking at a small subset of them. There's a bunch off to the left and the right and on the other side and some in front. And the, the program that generates these pictures takes in a database that looks like this. Just a bunch of triangles and the triangles have some colors associated with them, some fractal dimension. And it turns them into that. Now, <coughs> uh, this picture has a few digital flaws in it and the contrast is poor, but uh, you can see what, that's the same database. Is it the same view? Uh, same, yeah, same, same view, same direction. Uh, different aspect ratio and colors are slightly varied because of the way it was reproduced on different machines. Would you go back once and 
Sure. There it is. Let's stretch that out a little bit. Yeah. See this black up here? Oops. <laughs> black up there, right? Uh, became this ridge, mm -hmm. and that black became this stuff here. And this, who knows where that came from? <laughs> uh, well, came from down here. This is a long, long, thin piece of black, and so it, it tends to get, it'll, it'll rise up high because it has a lot to work with. Uh, the, uh, the black surfaces have high dimension, the green surfaces are medium, and the white surfaces are relatively low. Uh, there is, in fact, a notch through the hill up here, and this triangle is due to a bad triangulation. Uh, it's almost vertical, and it really doesn't belong in the model. If this were a handcrafted model for some, some uh, intelligent end use, uh, that wouldn't appear in it. Uh, but this is, in fact, a three-dimensional shape. And you can, uh, if you want, stand up here and look that way or, or uh, whatever. I've, in fact, done it. Uh, but these are all triangles, all triangles. And from now on out, I'm just going to talk triangles. How do you do the shading? Do you do individual shading? Yes. Um, the way it's done is uh, basically recursive. You start with a triangle, and you break it up into little, littler and littler triangles. And this program, uh, when the triangle is small enough, and most of the triangles in this picture that are small enough are about that big. Uh, although down here, they may be a little bit bigger. Uh, they're flat shaded. It just computes a normal and, a and, a, and the light source and, and a simple little formula combination of the inner, it's a simple function of the inner product. And it comes up with the shading value and paints it in flat. To get the same thing again, you, you just run the same random number generator? Right, same seed. I get the same picture. And, and you just don't do the parts which you won't see. Like right, the, there's a, a, an important process here that <clears throat> guarantees the same shape from one frame to the next, even though the same, the same scene is not, it's not the same scene. That is to say, if you, if you move in on this bump here, the shape of the bump is preserved, and all the randomness that goes into creating that bump is preserved from one frame to the next, so that bump will still be there. It's not totally random. It's just random in the right way. And in fact, the, the program will generate detail to fill in the cracks as you, as you move in on it. Uh, and that detail is consistent from frame to frame. Uh, in fact, I, I don't think I would have even started this project unless I had been able to prove that in advance. Can you tell us? Yeah, I'll, I'll explain. I've got a half an hour. That's plenty of time. <laughs> I'll tell you how to do that. Sure. It's easy. It's real easy. OK, here's a little picture. Uh, this is a, um, it's a little fuzzy. Uh, this is um, a piece of a world that I built for my film. Uh, some of you have seen the film. Maybe all of you. I don't know. I was going to try and bring it, but I loaned it out, and the guy didn't send it back. And I called him up, and he didn't send it back. I'll get it someday. He was showing in this class. He, he was, yes. Uh, North Carolina, so I can't go beat on his door. OK. For those of you who have seen the film, uh, most of it takes place over here. Uh, this is about 40 miles away. Uh, and also, part of, there's a track that runs along out, out this way. Yeah, there's a, there's a, yeah, a f there's a shark, sh shark fin on, at the end. Yeah, that, that's the one. Right. Okay. <laughs> this is a scene looking the other way. That's where you were before. And um, the uh, this is a little bit higher and and away from where the the film is. It's sort of behind me. Um, and that's a ridge that's just somewhere off in the distance. I found it one day. Is this the <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this, this is a big place. And, uh, is this the correct orientation, or, or is the one in the SIG graph closed? This is correct. They flipped it to that. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote, view from this side on every one of my slides. This is the correct way. Uh, although, you know, who cares? Can you sell this to the adventure people? Okay? Um, it's not fast anybody's interested. Uh, this. Um, this mountain is defined by one data point. It's up there somewhere. <laughs> um, there's some color creeping in down here. Uh, if there's a little bit of green and some, this is a, in fact, a darker gray, because this face over here of the mountain has got a, a dark gray edge on it that's that's creeped its way up, and uh, the light gray is on this side. So 
So it, it has all the attributes of, of a real world in the sense that you could go look at some arbitrary place down there. Absolutely. And come back to it two months later and it's got the same. Right. Reasons. Absolutely. And if you don't like it, you give it another seed and you get a different mountain. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, this, this was not the first shot. Uh, what I wanted was a, a ragged looking ridge with some scenery in the back. And so I knew at one particular spot there was some rough mountains that I'd put in <coughs> about 10 miles or so off to the northwest. And uh, so I went over there and backed off to like 10,000 feet and sort of opened up the perspective on the, on the view and started making pictures until I got one just giving different seeds. And I got one that looked, hmm, that's, that's ragged enough. And so where is it? And figured it out on the map, typed in the coordinates, and then moved around, and, and there we go. Uh, took about an hour. You say you have color creeping up on the, on the side there. I take it when you gave the seed, you also gave some colors. Uh, in a way. I'll explain that in a minute, too. Well, you could, of course, also randomly generate those. Uh, sort of. Uh, yes. Have you included people in this world worshiping you? In the <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I don't know how to do people. Um, but uh, one, one interesting little, little quip that, that comes to mind when you mention that <laughs> is that, um, that God didn't have to work as hard as you thought he did. <laughs> uh, so, um, okay, I think that's, that's my last slide. And, uh, okay. Yeah, I can make crude pictures in a hurry, or, or the, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the, the pictures can be like two or three, four minutes, or 20 minutes, or 40 minutes, or whatever, depending on how long you want to wait, how long, how fine you want. Pictures in the film averaged about um, 25 minutes. And those were 512 by 512? Uh, right, no attempt whatsoever to anti-alias the pictures. And uh, that was partly done as an experiment and partly because it would have taken longer. Uh, <laughs> 400 hours of computer time in that film. So... Do you have a paper already published on um, that? Just the SIGGRAPH uh, preliminary paper. It's, it's in this little thing. You can find it. SIGGRAPH 80... Uh, yeah, there are, there are some floating around. Um, Let's see. In fact, I can, while I'm at it here, there's some pictures by the fellows in Texas who have done patch models. And I think I'll, I'll put them on the tape just so that, that they'll get in the record. Okay. We, oh, the, yeah, the, the paper, and this, this is a uh, special SIGGRAPH 80 issue. Um, the name of my paper, which is in here, is Computer Rendering of Fractal Curves and Surfaces. The uh, combined paper of, of both of our uh, efforts here, because they had essentially the same discovery, is uh, called Computer Rendering of Stochastic Models. And uh, that's a tentative title, and everybody agrees that it's what we wanted. But uh, these are examples of, if it shows up on the monitor. Uh, of bicubic patch planets that are done to varying levels of resolution. And uh, let's see, different scales, same uh, tolerance, but different scales. And here's an example of zooming in on, on this peninsula, which then appears bigger, bigger, bigger. If you notice, there's a, uh, a discontinuity, so to speak, between this picture and that picture right there with this this uh, isthmus disappears. Uh, there's a simple explanation for that, and uh, I'll get into that if you, uh, if you want to take the time. Uh, this, uh, this is a little bit more than it looks like. What they've done here is that each of these surfaces has a different dimension, but they all have the same area. So that in effect, what they've got is a piece of crumpled paper and varying stages of crumple. Uh, <coughs> so this paper, is that, and uh, I'm sure it's available from, by uh, writing the University of Dallas, Texas, Dallas. Um, <clears throat> okay, it's it's got much better math than uh, than you'll find in in Mandelbrot's book or in any of my papers. Uh, if you want to know all about fractional Brownian motion, 
and uh, how to mangle, their, mangle the statistics, it, it's in there. <clears throat> Uh, okay, now, I have a bunch of things to explain. <clears throat> Let's see, this is, um, everybody done copying? Okay. That's right. Actually, that doesn't help one monitor, just camera. Okay. Okay. Air monitor, overhead camera monitor, okay. Air monitor, that seems a little funny. Is there a worry about pollution? It's really very simple. Uh, the, um, let's see. The idea, first of all, let's see if I can explain how to do that. The triangular subdivision process is, uh, is, 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 a, is a relative of the quadrilateral subdivision process. If I have a triangle, each of these points says some x, y, and z, and I break the midpoint, find midpoint of each of these points, and displace it vertically in the z direction to create a new triangle. So from the top, Looks just like that. <coughs> now, <clears throat> this is the process used to make all the pictures that you've seen, the triangle-based pictures. This, these are, in fact, uh, similar triangles. In fact, they're identical triangles, in, f as viewed from above. That's not strictly necessary, and there are a lot of uh, variants on that that I'm going to explore someday. But um, this is reasonably uh, sufficient. So. <clears throat> In the, in the picture that's on the uh, monitor, what we have is uh, green, blue, and red. Now, <clears throat> initially when I started this, in fact, just about every process that's, that's done in computer graphics for making pictures of, of uh, any solid object, is uh, you assign colors to faces or colors to surfaces. Well, this doesn't work. You have to assign colors to vertices. And <clears throat> what the process is, it's uh, quite simple. When the surface is subdivided, we have to come up with a color for those vertices. So what we do is flip a coin. <clears throat> now, the, uh, this is, this, that's the easy part. The hard part is, suppose I have another surface over here, and I'm going to subdivide this surface. Well, when if I want the, uh, the surface to have any kind of continuity at all, see zero continuity in color, then I better get the same color on this side as I get on this side. And so <clears throat> we can't flip an arbitrary coin. We have to flip a special coin. <clears throat> the way it works is that each vertex has associated with it x, y, z, uh, a color and a tag. Tag uh, is loaded in, in initially in the database, one through n vertices. Doesn't matter as long as it's, as long as they're different. They're not all zero or some pathological case. Uh, so <clears throat> what we do is to generate the the random number for this point, because not only do we have to have the same color, we have to have the same displacement to come out here, so the surface is connected as well as the same color. Otherwise, we'd end up with just a cloud of triangles that would have no meaning whatsoever. We have to have the same random number from this side and from that side. And so what we do is we take these, the tag for this end and the tag for that end and add them up and take that number modulo some number and look it up in a random number table. You get the same number every time. And then the tag for this point is the sum of those two so that, that when you go to work here, you get the same ones from both sides. And <clears throat> so that at every, every point where you have, uh, let's see, at every point where subdivision takes place from both sides, you're guaranteed to have the same tag generated from the same base pair at that point, and hence the same random number, and hence the same color. Now, the color is decided by a little, there's a little, there's another further condition on the color. Uh, the colors are not random, as you can see from this picture. Well, on the monitor, the same, the same gray, but nevertheless, 
<coughs> the, uh, the colors are not random. And uh, the way it's done is that to pick the color at this point, since we've given a random number, the random number is either positive or negative. If it's positive, we take the color associated with the low tag. And if it's negative, we take the color associated with a high tag. That guarantees that we get the same, we're looking in the same direction when we, from both sides. Some simple symmetry thing like that. And so then you have, this, you have the same color and the same displacement at this point in the surfaces and continuous. Now, that's how these, that's how it was done. Now the world that, with, that we're flying around in uh, has about 15 colors in it, that's all. And all the, uh, the shades of gray and the texturing and whatnot is just done by very, very fine rough surfaces with the light bouncing off them at, at different angles. It's purely geometric texture. There's no, uh, no tricked in texture maps or normal maps or anything like that. It's just strict geometric. So that's, that's, how, that's how I did color. Now there's lots of other ways to do this. Besides having a tag, you can have some, um, some, some number, some floating point number or, or whatever, that um, instead of adding them up, you average them. And then you can, you can leave it to your imagination to go from there. But this is enough to get started. Yes? Don't you need to offset the same midpoint, the same amount? Yes, you do. The same displacement. And the displacement at this point is determined by the product of this length, the random number that you get out of the table, and some roughness factor. And the roughness factor in the pictures that you've seen is associated with the color. The color is, in fact, R, G, B, and uh, some dimension. R the roughness, the fractal dimension. And so, since uh, there's millions of these vertices and a few colors, it was easier to have this thing as dimension. Also, too, the dimension is associated with the color so that if you want trees everywhere, then the trees have the same texture, as it were. So you already have a semantic attribute uh, that says type of surface, and from that you can derive both color and, and, dimension. and roughness, and you just, for the heck of it, it's represented as color. Right. Well, for the purposes of, of the color discussion, I've I in color, but it's really a, a color table tag, and right, you're quite right. <clears throat> so uh, that's, that's the basic subdivision process. Now, there's one I'm going to explore next, and that is to take uh, the triangle, say, and split the longest edge at the midpoint, do binary subdivision. Because this one works OK, in fact, it works quite well, provided that the triangles are roughly equilateral. But there are, if, if this is a fairly smooth surface, in the limit, what you get is a lot of parallel lines that look like this. And uh, down low with a, a good light angle on it, a shallow angle and, and whatnot, it looks like, like uh, postage stamps or fields or, or you know, wheat fields or something. But this process does weird things to, to lines that, that uh, remain to be determined. Uh, that's, in fact, uh, in, a, in a few weeks, we should have this one running on our machine. Um, OK, so that's triangle subdivision. Now, <clears throat> OK, I showed you how to guarantee that the surface is C0 and the color is C0. Now, there's another thing that uh, you're going to run into right away if you try to do anything non-trivial. And that is clipping. OK. Clipping these things is uh, not easy. Uh, I don't know what they've discussed about clipping, if they discovered the Southern Hodgman clipper or regular polygon clippers or, or whatever. Uh, Something, I suppose. OK, so you know roughly what clipping is. Well, clip one of these. <coughs> uh, the way it's done, really very simple. Uh, very simple. If I have, say I would draw a perspective picture here. Uh, I is, uh, let's say, this is, I is looking this way into big Z. Yeah, Z. And uh, this is my viewing pyramid. And like that. OK. And if I have objects out here, varying distances, I think I'm going to throw this drawing away. 
uh, some of these objects are totally contained inside the box. Some are outside and some are partly inside and partly outside. And at any one time, I can tell if I have a bound on the object as to whether it's one of those three states. Uh, let's go back to a straight-on view of what you'd see looking at the screen and show me what I mean. If I have, uh, let's say, a, an incoming triangle, there's the, tri there's the image of the perspective image of the triangle in the picture. Now, if by some magical process we can put a bound on this triangle such that the, fractal, the fractalization process applied to this triangle will create a surface that under no conditions will ever exceed that box, <coughs> then I have a true bounding box on this thing. And I can decide at that point whether it is totally contained on the, in the image, partially contained in the image, or it doesn't matter where the triangle is, or totally outside the image. And <clears throat> based on those three decisions, the subdivision process continues. If you have this, obviously throw it away. This, obviously never check it again. And this, you keep checking this, this descendants. Uh, <clears throat> so, <coughs> oh, <clears throat> maybe I should explain the, uh, the subdivision process itself. You bring in a triangle and essentially the, the, they're done independently with a z-buffer, a simple dumb z-buffer. All these pictures are done with a dumb z-buffer. Uh, the uh, triangle comes in in some arbitrary order, doesn't matter not what order. Find a box for it and check to see which of these states it's in. And uh, <clears throat> then we check to see if it's small and its visual size on the screen is how, many, how big is this box, essentially. The box is a few pixels high or whatever the, t the current tolerance is for the image quality. Then the, uh, the triangle goes straight to the tiler and it's painted in the picture. If the box is too big, then we apply the subdivider and break the thing up into pieces and stack them. Those just, they're, they're just stacked. And uh, so one, one comes off the stack and four go back on the stack. And then we pull them off and look at them. And if, if the box is small and if they're visible, then they go to the tiler. Otherwise, if they're off the screen, they're thrown away. If they're still on this, if, you know, if, if they're in this state, or then we check them. If they're, if they're on the screen, if they're, one of their ancestors was on the screen, we don't even bother to check it. Anything to save time. So uh, they just keep coming off the stack till the stack's empty. And um, then we go get another triangle. Okay, now to bound this thing, <clears throat> Uh, I'm not sure. I didn't bring the code with me, but um, I can tell you enough, I think, to get you started. It's going to take a little work. The bound that I have <coughs> is for the line-to-line -line function, and it's, it's outrageously simple, but it uh, has not been generalized yet to the the line-to-line -line function that the fellows from Texas did with the uh, the mathematically better uh, results at high levels of subdivision. Although this bound is guaranteed to work for these pictures. <coughs> uh, what we have, given, say, a, a line segment. Uh, now we have a, a random number table. This is one of the advantages of the number table. This random number table has some mean and uh, it has some mac maximum and some minimum. And really all we're interested in is the maximum and minimum. In fact, all we're interested in is the maximum absolute value of the number in this table. What that means is, is that maximum absolute value puts a limit on the displacement that can never be achieved uh, by subdividing a line. Because this, this shape here is, is dependent on this table and on nothing else. Because this is always proportional to that. And... Um, than the roughness factor, of course. Now, <clears throat> so what we do is that takes care of one level of subdivision. Well, it turns out that if you, if you take uh, a simple horizontal line segment, and, and it's easily adjusted if the line segment's not horizontal, divide it in the middle, take some, some fixed subdivision, or some, some fixed displacement. Let's call it one. OK, now, if. Let's, let's, let's say uh, we're going to flip heads a million times in a row. And every time we flip the coin, it comes up one. So the next time we're working on this side, this, this section of the line is half as long as that because we're measuring this distance and not that distance. This is the distance we want to measure. 
Okay, so we got we're half the length of the line, but the same number comes up in the table, and so we generate a displacement that's half as much as that one. Okay, what that has done has given us a little flat spot up here of height one that's of length a quarter. <clears throat> when we apply this process again, we get something that looks like that, that is of height one fourth of length one sixteenth. And no matter what you do over here, you can't get any higher than that. And uh, no matter what you do in here, you can't get any higher than that. And so this eventually ends up about there. Now, <clears throat> somewhere in my code is the exact number of which that is. I think it's one and a third. But uh, you're certainly welcome to derive it yourself. And um, in fact, you can use one and a half and be safe. Plus, plus yes? At some point, at some point you're going to get, you're not doing any anti-alias since you're going to get so small that, that it wouldn't really matter. You could stop with something. Right. Well, that kind of well no, so small, actually, it could all be, it could be a square that size. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this is this is, a, is an absolute worst case. Yeah. Okay, and so what this means is that given this line segment, that uh, I now have a box. It won't, won't ever go this way. Uh, that due to the numbers in the random number table and this this uh, limit number, which is a simple multiple of you know the the, the size of the, the mag magnitude of the table, uh, I have an aspect ratio, so to speak, on this box. Yes. Now that all takes place in real coordinates, and you have to then prospect that. That's box. right. That's right. This takes place in in, in uh, model space. All the subdivision is done in model space, not in screen space. <clears throat> so um, this is the process used to derive the bound. And given the bound on the line, we then derive a bound on the box, on a bo derive the box on the triangle. And this is, this is another little trick that's uh, absolutely vital if you're trying to make things that are connected. Because let's say, that's not a good example. Let's say we have. Uh, better than that. Two triangles like this. This one is big, and so we're going to cut it up. This one is not, so we won't. Now, what do we do about this point here? <clears throat> well, what we do about that point is uh, <clears throat> worry, unless we got a good example. Because if you don't don't, don't do something with this with this edge, that's the same on both sides, you're going to create a hole. And a really nasty hole, since we're dealing with, with r ragged surfaces in the first place. So <clears throat> the solution here is really very simple. Uh, basically, there's two rules. A triangle is subdivided if and only if any one of the boxes associated with any one of its edges is bigger than the tolerance. Okay, so for example, if one edge is long and the other two are short, we subdivide the uh, the triangle. All it takes is one to subdivide the triangle. But the other rule is that if the edge itself is shorter than the tolerance, then it's simply bisecting, and the colors are assigned as as though they were otherwise. So this means that that the subdivision criteria is basically determined on the edges and not on the surfaces, on the size of the surface or the flatness of the surface or any of that stuff, determined solely on the boxes of the edges. And in fact, <coughs> the box on the edge, the, the, since remember we have, we, have we have different colors at the ends of this edge. And this means that the, that the random number, that is to say the offset, the offset multiple for the the, the determines the size of this box. I mean, you may have dimension zero on one end and and or low and, and high dimension on the other end. The offset that determines the size of this box has to be determined by the the tag that would be created at the midpoint. See to get the right multiple. Little things like that make the difference. So <clears throat> anyway, this basically is two rules: is that we subdivide a triangle if any of the edges are too big, and we subdivide the edge. Linearly, if it doesn't, if if it's shorter than the tolerance, 
Um, that's really quite a bit to, to dump on you all at once. But um, just knowing that, plus a little bit of, of hacking, you can make pictures like that.